this lecture I'll be looking at Midsummer Night's Dream and in particular focusing on the image of the moon and look at some of the ways in which this word is used and how it contributes to the meaning of the play. Now what I've done is use the Shakespeare concordance to look up all occurrences of the word moon or words in which the word moon is a part in order to trace the image and see how it's transformed and how it's used throughout the play. So we notice that it's, we can see all these different characters. Theseus says it at the very beginning, as does Hippolyta. Aegis talks about moonlight, Theseus, moon, moon, moonlight, moons, all the different characters that are talking about it. And so this gives me an easy way just to go and pick out places where it seems like it's an important image. You can go to the next page and see the other uses of it all throughout the play. And this helps us, helps me to find different sections so I can compare and contrast and see, well, here this one character is using moon in a certain way, here another character is using it in a different way, these are the associations, these are the moods, these are the um, ideas that are associated with it, and so we can see how it doesn't mean just one thing, it's not just a simple image, but rather it's a very complex and transformative idea that Shakespeare uses to enrich his play and enrich our understanding of what's going on. So it's useful to start off by thinking about some of the meanings that are associated with the moon in Shakespeare's time. First among these is that the moon is called the lesser light um, when compared with the sun. So that's a fairly obvious comparison or association. The moon is also associated with madness, uh, lunacy, the word luna as the word for moon. So madness comes uh, from the moon or is associated with the moon's effects. Uh, the moon is known as the border of the heavenly realms in Renaissance astrology. So above the moon is the world of the heavens. This is the world of unchanging perfection. Whereas the sublunary world, the world that we live in below the moon, is the world of impermanence and change, life and death and so forth. And the moon is also very frequently in Shakespeare's time feminized. That is to say, the moon is associated with various mythical goddesses. And there are a number of goddesses that it's associated with. First among these is Phoebe, um, who is a titaness in ancient Greek mythology. And she's associated with prophecy and oracles, knowledge. Uh, Selene, who is um, somehow related to Phoebe, I don't remember the exact genealogy in the myths, uh, also known as Luna. And Selene is the actual personification of the moon. She is the goddess who drives her moon chariot across the sky during the night, just as during the day a sun god, uh, Phoebus, drives the sun across in a chariot. The moon is also associated with Artemis, um, who is sometimes known as Cynthia, known in the Roman pantheon as Diana. And this is a goddess who we see pictured here, uh, the goddess of hunting, the goddess of wilderness and wild animals, also though the goddess of childbirth and the goddess of virginity. So these goddesses are all associated with virginity, childbirth, and so forth. Um, and then finally, there's the goddess Hecate, um, who we have saw mentioned in Macbeth. And she is a more mysterious goddess associated with magic, sorcery, um, protection, various herbs and poisons, sometimes associated with some darker things, but she's really a sort of older kind of goddess that dates to a pre-Greek mythology uh, and who's associated with the moon and its very magical, mysterious effects. So all of these goddesses are figures that are associated with the moon, and whenever Shakespeare would have talked about the moon or, or used the image of the moon, these various goddesses, we could count on the audience perhaps associating the moon with or thinking of these various characters. Now looking at some specific passages where the word moon is used, it comes up right at the beginning of the play uh, in the conversation between Theseus and Hippolyta. He talks about four days, four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. Um, Hippolyta, on the other hand, says the days will go by quickly and then the moon will behold the night of our solemnities. 
So they each use the moon in talking about their situation and how they feel about their situation. And that situation, to remind ourselves, it's the eve of their wedding. They're about to get married, or a few days later, they're planning to get married. However, we should also pay attention to the strangeness of their relationship. That is, how did Theseus and Hippolyta come to be married? Well, their courtship was actually a conquest. Theseus has defeated the Amazons and thus taken their queen as his bride. So we might ask ourselves, what does Theseus want in this situation? And how does the moon relate to his desires? And what does Hippolyta want in this situation? So if we look closely at what Theseus says, he's talking about the passage of time between now and their wedding night. And he says it's too slow. The old moon is lingering his desires or wearing them out or keeping him from fulfilling his desires. What is the desire that he wants? Well, to wed and bed his wife Hippolyta. And he compares the moon to two female figures, a stepdame, that is a stepmother, and a dowager or a widow. And these are both negative connotations because he compares them to a stepmom or a dowager that long wears out a young man's revenue, that wastes his time, wastes his money. So for Theseus, the moon, he highlights the associations with virginity and chastity and the ways in which these associations frustrate him. This sort of female power that is exempt from his authority, these women that are more powerful than a young man and that keep him from fulfilling his sexual and erotic desires with his wife. Now, what does Hippolyta say about the moon? Well, she's also talking about the passage of time, but she says it's going to go by very quickly and perhaps too quickly. We might think, does Hippolyta really want to marry this man? If she is a queen who has just been conquered and now is forced to marry this king, how authentic might her feelings be? And this is something that's played with in different interpretations. Sometimes she's portrayed as being very much in love with Theseus. Sometimes she's portrayed as being very much not happy about this marriage. So she talks about the passage of time going quickly. And she compares the moon not to these negative female characters. Uh, she says it's like a silver bow. So we might think, again, remembering that Hippolyta is an Amazon, a race of warrior women, she's subtly highlighting the martial or military ideas behind the moon. And she says the moon is going to behold their solemnities, that is, their wedding and possibly the wedding night, the consummation of their marriage. So Hippolyta's use of the moon is more positive and subtly different from Theseus's. He doesn't associate it so much with virginity or frustration, or she doesn't, excuse me, she talks about the moon as a, protect, as a protectress, something that protects her and perhaps her husband, and, and she suggests its association with, warrior, with a warrior maiden. So it very much shows Hippolyta's side and how the moon to her means something very different and allows her to express probably very different feelings about the approaching wedding than Theseus, her husband-to-be. Later in the same scene, we see the word moon, the image of the moon, come up in a different context, in the discussion between Theseus and Hermia. And here, Theseus warns Hermia, question your desires, know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I, to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Again, let us consider the situation. And this is another male-female conflict, perhaps, but this time between father and daughter, Aegeus and his daughter, Hermia. And it's a situation where young love is thwarted. Hermia wants to marry Lysander. Her father, Aegeus, wants her to marry Demetrius. And so we have this context of the law that Aegeus is bringing to bear against his daughter, that he quite literally owns her through his law. And he is demanding that Theseus uphold this law and force Hermia to do as he wishes or she will have to be um, punished. And she is given, ultimately by Theseus, three choices. She can marry Demetrius, as her father wants, or she can be executed, 
which is her father's other option. And Theseus adds the third option, she can become celibate. She can become a nun, essentially. So this is a situation that gives shape to how Theseus is using the image of the word moon, the image of the moon, in his conversation with Hermia. So what is the nature of Theseus's threat? Well, he calls the moon cold and fruitless. So it's again associating with celibacy, with chastity, but in a very dark way. This isn't a kind of um, exalted or noble virginity. This is a death-like chastity. This is a celibacy that keeps you out of the world of love, out of the world of marriage and reproduction, and it ensures that you're going to be essentially worshiping this moon, praying to this cold goddess, and you get no pleasure, no life out of it. So here, Theseus is, even though there's this third choice between marriage and death of celibacy, really that celibacy is a kind of living death, as Theseus portrays it. So here, the moon is again associated by Theseus with sort of negative connotations, with an ending with death with nothingness and it's associated and it goes back to that association with chastity with virginity which from theseus's point of view is a negative Now let's look at another character who refers to the moon a few times, and that's Titania, the queen of the fairies. Um, and in Act 2, Scene 1, in talking to her husband Oberon, she talks about the moon, who is pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. Um, and she's, so she's talking about the moon as a cause or involved with these natural disasters and diseases that are spreading throughout the, the world at this time. And in Act, C, Act 3, Scene 1, she talks about the moon looking with a watery eye on the world. The first usage of it in that situation, this is during her first encounter with Oberon, who was her husband. Now we know that this, they are an estranged couple. They are at odds with one another over this young child that Titania has and that Oberon wants to make one of his knights. And in the first situation, she associates the moon with anger and destruction. However, it's not that the moon is bad itself. It's that the moon is angry over what has happened. So this distemper, these natural disasters that the moon is causing, they actually reflect the disruption in Oberon and Titania's relationship. So the moon here is not itself bad, but rather it is acting in accordance with the disruption that Oberon and Titania have called through has ca have caused, excuse me, through their arguing, through their fighting. In the second situation in which Titania refers to the moon, uh, she has been enchanted, and she has fallen in love with Bottom, who has also himself been enchanted. To he has been transformed, so he has a donkey's head, an ass's head, and Titania here is instructing her servants, the other fairies, to take their to take Bottom and to silence him, to tie up his tongue, to take him to Titania's bower, or her boudoir, her bedroom, where she sleeps and does other things that you might do in a bedroom. And the moon is watching with a watery eye, so it gives this image of weeping, of sadness, but also this sense of fluidity, of flowing, which is what desire does. Desire flows from one body to the next. But here the moon's watery eye is sort of showing the stifling of that desire. And the flowers weep in sympathy over their own enforced chastity. So the moon is associated with chastity, celibacy again, but as opposed to Theseus's use where the moon closes off desire, here the moon and nature that responds in sympathy with the moon expresses physically the erotic desires that motivate Titania. The desire for uh, the, the feeling of sadness over enforced chastity is the frustration that Titania feels prior to being able to consummate her relationship with Bottom. So the moon is associated with chastity, but also with the desires that might be built up behind that chastity. It is not a cold and fruitless moon, as Theseus says, but a desiring moon.
And another use of the word moon to highlight comes from bottom. And in Act 5, Scene 1, during his performance as Pyramus, he says, Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy gracious, golden, glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe sight. Now, in this situation, again, Bottom is performing as Pyramus, who is a tragic lover. And it's obvious this scene is a scene of comic relief. Bottom and his friends are very bad performers. The lines, the verse that he gives is very uh, tacky and, and hackneyed poetry. And there's a certain comic relief. He thanks the moon for its sunny beams. It's just a silly mistake that Bottom makes of calling the moon sunny when it's obviously not. And so the misunderstanding and his, his misspeaking here highlights the comedy of his inept performance. It highlights that Bottom doesn't really know what he's doing as an actor, and he's a very bad actor, even though he loves to perform. But there's something a little bit more going on than just this joke of calling the moon sunny. This contradiction, this paradox of a sunny moon, it resonates with other odd matches, other odd pairings that we see throughout the play. For example, Theseus and Hippolyta, the warrior king and the Amazon queen, who are at odds with each other, yet they are getting married. Uh, the four lovers, who, in all the various transformations um, and the ways in which they are made to love or hate one another due to magic. So there's all those odd pairings and reshufflings of, of pairs that go on with the four lovers. And of course, Bottom himself, his own transformation, from uh, where he becomes both human and animal in one. It's a contradiction. It's a paradox, just like the sunny moon. So Bottom's comic use of the word moon informs and, and speaks to and underlines the more serious uses of the moon and serious ideas throughout the, the play. to do something just a little bit different, rather than looking at particular characters and scenes and their reactions to each other and how they're using the word moon, I want to focus on the word moonlight and just collect a number of different appearances of the word moonlight in the play and see what they have in common, see the comparisons between them. So we have in Act 1, Scene 1, Aegeus talking about moonlight. In Act 1, Scene 2, Quince mentions it. Oberon and Titania, both in Act 2, Scene 1, use the word moonlight as they discuss each other. And then a little bit later in the play, Quince uses the word moonlight again. So what do these meanings have in common? What do these uses have in common? And what do they tell us? How is Shakespeare playing on this other associated image, associated with the moon, of moonlight? So what are the various associations that we have with the image of moonlight here? Well, as you see in common, a lot of these usages of the word are talking about clandestine meetings, secret meetings, Lysander's and Hermia's courtship. The players have to go perform because they don't want people to know their tricks, their acting tricks. And the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, their meeting and death occurs by moonlight. So there's association with romance as nighttime, moonlight is a romantic time, but also nighttime can be associated with danger. And Aegeus talks about uh, Lysander's moonlight meetings with Hermia as a kind of trickery or magic, perhaps referring to the association with Hecate, the goddess of magic, and so forth. Um, and of course, also during moonlight is when Pyramus and Thisbe died. So there's a tragic romantic element to that, but also moonlight nighttime is when dangerous creatures come out, when dangerous events might occur. And Oberon and Titania, in their meeting and discussion and the various usages of the word moonlight, they highlight this association of, the, of moonlight as a time and place where meetings, unions, reunions occur. Oberon says, ill met by moonlight, proud Titania, highlighting that normally under moonlight their meetings would be positive, but this is an ill meeting. Whereas Titania says, if you can be kind, 
if you cannot cause problems, if you want to be loving and, and resolve this conflict, then you can watch our moonlight revels. So she offers the time and place of moonlight as something for them to resolve their conflict. So we can see how this image, this very slight image of moonlight, resonates in all these different scenes, all these different situations, and brings them together, saying there's something in common with all of these ideas, with these different secret meetings, with these different romances and loves and dangers and conflicts. The moonlight is what brings them together. So to briefly review what we've seen, the moon as an image carries multiple connotations and associations. And Shakespeare draws on all of these in his play. It's very easy to say, well, the moon equals celibacy. And then anytime you see the word moon mentioned, you just substitute in the idea of celibacy. But that's not how Shakespeare works. Rather, he recognizes that the moon is a rich and deep resource of meanings, many of which conflict with each other. And he brings them all to bear in different ways in his play. And they're used by characters in distinct ways. They show us different, they give us insight into the character's thoughts and moods, and they also change vary, varying on the situation. And the different meanings that Shakespeare brings to bear in his play all comment on and contribute to one another. That one character uses it in a positive way, another character uses it in a negative way, another character uses it to, to be associated with desire, another character uses it to be associated with secrecy. All of these meanings are playing together. And the meaning of the word moon transforms as the play develops. It takes on new meanings and it changes, just as the characters change throughout the play. So we want to be always attentive to and open to the complexity of any image that Shakespeare uses, not trying to reduce it to one single meaning, but rather being open to all of its richness. So some final tips for your own assignment of using the Shakespeare Concordance to, to trace the usage of a particular image throughout the play. You want to choose a word that's rich in possible meanings. So, so you don't want to choose the word the or is, but you choose something like moon that has a lot of possible meanings. Um, and you want to understand what the basic associations and connotations of that word are. What does it mean to you? What different ideas are associated with the moon or with flowers or with whatever, um, and see how all of those different associations are brought up in the play. You want to consider the situation in which the image is being used. What's the context? What's the relationship between the characters? What's happening in that scene? And look for patterns, repetitions, contrasts, so that we see the words moon is repeated three times in the first couple of speeches of the play, but each usage is a little bit different. First, Theseus wants a new moon, then he complains about the old moon, then Hippolyta talks about the moon as a beautiful silver bow that's going to watch over and protect them. So there's a pattern of repetition and also a developing sense of different meanings. So pay attention to how the meaning changes. Don't just try to say that, well, the meaning at the beginning of the play is the same meaning at the end. Look at those different changes and be attentive to them. And consider how the uses relate to and reveal the characters. How does Theseus's particular usage of the word moon show his, one, his powerful desire for Hippolyta, but also perhaps his disdain for female authority, given the negative comparisons to a stepmother or a widow, versus Hippolyta's positive uses, uses of the word moon as something that protects and watches over her and that's associated with military prowess. So the usage of the word moon, the character, it, it says something about the characters themselves. And finally, be open to complexity, ambiguity, multiplicity. The worst thing you can do when reading Shakespeare or when reading any type of literature is to try to reduce things down to a simple single meaning. Rather, you want to open up the play, open up the text, and look at all the different multiple meanings and see how when combined together, they create something new.